Grace Teens Illuminate. Again, we're jumping into the Word of God today, so we're going to be jumping over to Numbers chapter 21. Jump over there into the Word of God, and we'll see about the promise of God's provision in this chapter. And uh, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of sin and death. And because of our sin, we deserve death. We deserve that uh, separation from God. Uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Okay, so that's something that we need to be able to recognize in this passage today. We're going to be jumping from Numbers to John. You'll see that soon, but there's a, a connection there that we want you to see. So the bronze serpent points to both God's punishment of sin and his salvation through Jesus. So there is punishment, but there's salvation. That's what I love about our God is that, yes, because of his character, he needs to judge sin. But he seems to always provide a way of salvation. We just need to do the follow-through and have faith that his way is best, and we're going to trust in that. So as we get into this, think about it this way, all right? Think about what you put your faith in. See, if, if you were to um, decide all of a sudden you're bored, You've been in this quarantine for how long, right? And so you're bored and, and you want to go swim. You want to swim from San Diego to Japan. Yeah. Yeah, San Diego to Japan. Now, before you do that, let me, you know, tell me about it. And I'll, and I'll slap you first just to make sure that you know what you're doing. But all of a sudden you say, oh, I got to train. I got to get ready for this. Let's I'm, I'm going to do it. So you plan the day. You eat right. You train right. You're ready to go. You're having faith that your body can get you from San Diego to Japan swimming. And you're going to have this support boat going along beside you so you can get some, some water if you need it. You know, not salt water because that's absolutely nasty, but regular water. And some food, you know, just to keep you going, right? So how many of you believe that you could do this? So you show up on the day, ready to go. Everybody's ready, cheering for you. They're all excited. I'm not sure why, because they know you can't do this. Uh, but you are putting your faith in your body that you can be able to cross from San Diego to Japan. So you get out there and you get about five miles in because you've been training so hard. And you come up on a storm. And you cry out to the boat and say, help me, I can't swim any longer, I'm going to die. All of a sudden, knowing that your body was not designed to traverse San from San Diego to Japan, trying to swim. You find out that your body was not designed for that, but a boat was. So you put your faith in a boat get you where you need to go, right? Where's this pointing to? See, you were not designed to get yourself to God. So putting your faith in you, your grandparents, your church, whatever it might be, your money, your good looks, whatever it might be, putting your faith in that, it, none of those things were designed to get you to heaven, to get you to God. Only through Jesus. Jesus was designed as what we need to have faith in. Who we need to have faith in in order to get to God. He's that bridge. He's the bridge there. So as we get into this and we see Jesus was designed for that, we'll see a picture of that back in the Old Testament. So Israel has, has deemed to wander 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because all of a sudden they started complaining. They thought they were going to die because even though all they needed to do was go right into the promised land and do what God told them to do, they decided, oh, no, we got to go back to Egypt. And so God says, okay, wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Let's see how you like that, right? So that's what they're doing. And, and what do they do on a consistent basis? What can we rely on for the Israelites to do? Complain. And guess what? We can rely on ourselves to do the same exact thing, can't we? We love to complain because it's not 
always the way that we want it. We want to have control over the situation. And, and, and so we love to complain. And so they were complaining, and you find them in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 7a. It says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, for, for have ye brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Really? Really? Here it goes again. For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Huh, what's going on here? We find that God has been continually faithful over and over and over again, and yet they still complain. So, uh, let me ask this question of you. When have you been impatient with God? When have you been impatient with God? Did your impatience lead, transition into complaining? Have you ever done that? Uh, yes, we have. When has that happened? Why? What's the motivation behind it? So, knowing what was going on here, God responds with punishment. He sends venomous snakes. They want to go back to Egypt. Here comes a plague, right? And so uh, venomous snakes that go in, they bite the people. Uh, the people die. I mean, this is a pretty serious thing. Why? Because God does not take lightly the sins of people. God does not take lightly when we accuse God of not being who he says he is, of going against his own character. See, when his character is lessened, then he's not God. So they're, they're, they're complaining, and their complaining is actually stating, God, I don't believe that you are God. I don't believe, I don't have faith that you are being faithful, okay? And so this is directly against God. So what does this punishment communicate about sin and, and the seriousness of it? God is very serious. And, and, and sometimes it takes death to get our attention to finally wake up and understand we got to stop sinning. And so the thing that they were hoping for, Egypt, huh? well, God's already proved himself against them, so here come snakes. So all of a sudden, after all of this was said and done, the people finally realized that they were wrong. So what do they do? They repent. They go to Moses. They ask for intercession. They ask for intercession. Moses, can you go to God for us? Can you go and plead for us? You know, here's a personal question. What do you do? How do you respond when you recognize that you've sinned? Do you repent? Do you ask for God's forgiveness? You can go directly. You don't have to have Moses intercede on your behalf. You can go directly to God. When's the last time you've done that? Is that something you need to do right now? So in Numbers 21, 7b, so finishing that, that first out, it says, Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So he prayed. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon the pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it up on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So when he actually looks up, God told, told Moses to make a, a serpent, put it up on a pole, and then when people are bit, they can actually look up and they can recover from this venom. They can be healed. They can live. Look and live. That's a song that we sing here at our church. Look and live, my brother, live. live. Look to Jesus now and live. Why? Because that's a picture. That's the Christ connection that goes directly along with this. God used the symbol of their sin as an instrument of his mercy. Why? Because as soon as they sin, he put in the punishment of the snake, so he, 
He, he made an image of the snake, put it up on the pole. They had to look to that in order to survive. All to show his mercy. He didn't have to do this. He could have just let them all die. He didn't have to do this. So you go over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Let's head, head over there. John chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What's going on here? Here's the Christ connection. That God provided. That Christ would have to be lifted up. On what? On the cross. And we'd have to look to him. We'd have to believe in him for salvation. See, faith begins when we believe what God has said about salvation. And that's the only way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That's it. The Israelites didn't have any other way in order to live. They had to look up at that pole with the snake. Same way, the only way for us to be able to have eternal life with God, for that separation to be non-existent it's through jesus the bridge the door it's the only way this is the truth and i'm trying to present to you that that really we need to understand and if you're holding back on that i wonder how many israelites died because they just didn't want to look up they didn't believe it what about you see the attitude towards our sin indicates your belief in God. So how does your attitude about your sin indicate your belief in God? Is he enough for you? He is enough, that's the truth, but is he enough for you? Do you believe that? And belief leads to action. If you believe it, you'll do something about it. So many people claim they believe but yet they never do anything. It's because they never believed in the first place. Never came to action. So how does the work of Jesus Christ lead you into a life of faith? I hope you really focus on the truth of this lesson. Sin does equal death, but Jesus equals life. Look and live. Have a great day.